Welcome everyone and uh, thank you for joining us. This is a Globe Op Talk. I am Bina Venkatraman. I am the Boston Globe's editorial page editor. And today's conversation is about performance art, political art, and its relationship to social change and political change. And I'm thrilled to welcome Dred Scott, who is a multidisciplinary artist who works across different medium, media uh, as an artist. And we're going to get into some of that today. And Dred is an incredible person. He's uh, exhibited and performed his art all around the world. He has work in the collection of the Whitney Museum of American Art, in the collection of the Brooklyn Museum of Art. He's exhibited um, everywhere from Cape Town, South Africa to um, New York City's MoMA PS1. And the reason I wanted to have this conversation with Dredd is that his work is quite provocative and uh, it has in many instances uh, had a direct relationship to political conversations of the moment and we're in a very uh, profound moment of political and social change right now uh, that I think it's important to kind of think about the role that art plays and uh, how artists intersect and uh, inform our thinking about our politics. So welcome, Dred, and thank you for doing this conversation. Well, I'm looking forward to the conversation and thank you so much for having me. Let's get into it. All right, let's get into it. So you have this work back when you were in art school. I kind of want to start with an old piece and then we'll get into mm -hmm. some of your performance art as we go. Uh, yeah. But you, um, it was in the late 80s, I believe, that you were a student at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And you put on display there uh, this exhibition called What is the Proper Way to Display a U.S. Flag? And uh, George W., sorry, George H.W. Bush, then president, called it disgraceful. Uh, it provoked quite a strong reaction. And ultimately, um, you were engaged or it was part of a Supreme Court uh, lawsuit, a lawsuit that went to the Supreme Court. Yeah. So can you show us that piece and uh, can we talk a little bit about what that piece was and what happened? Yeah, so uh, let's, let me share screen and hopefully the tech will work and, and we will uh, be able to see some images. And uh, yeah, come on. Uh, I want to play. So, so this is an image of what is the proper way to display a US flag. It is an artwork that exists in a gallery or a museum. And uh, it is an installation for audience participation. A lot of times when people think about art, they think of something that's static, it sits on the wall. Um, some of my work actually does that, but some of it also is interactive with the audience. And so this is an artwork that had a photo montage or photograph on the wall that had text that said, what's the proper way to display a US flag? And I'll show you a detail of that in a second. But below that, there were shelves that had books or shelf that had books that said that were blank that people could write responses to that question, what's the proper way to display a US flag? And below that was a three by five foot flag that people had the option of standing on as they wrote their responses. So this is the, the photo montage. And as you can see, it has the title text on it. It also has pictures of South Korean students burning an American flag holding signs that said, Yankee, go home, son of a bitch. And below that were flag draped coffins coming back from Vietnam in a troop transport. Um, people wrote lots of responses. So again, it's not just what I think about it. It's not just what sits on the wall. But you know, people wrote long answers, like they'd say on the right. Sometimes they wrote sh write shorter answers. Sometimes they'd write really short answers, like on a poll. Sometimes they wrote, you know, do drawings. This, this is from a display at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and somebody drew like American flag toilet paper. Um, and people wrote in all sorts of languages. There was Farsi, Arabic, Spanish, French, Italian, English, and lots of different languages. People really engaged with the question of what is the US flag and what is US patriotism? What does it represent? And people had the option to write whatever they wanted. And so, um, I mean, I'd be happy to show a couple examples of what people wrote, or we could just talk more about the work, you know, as it is. What, what would be most useful for your audience, do you think? Well, I would love to hear what inspired you to make this piece in which yeah. you walked on the American flag. Okay. Well, I mean, so this is, the piece was made in 1988. Um, I was doing a lot of work that was, I was doing a lot of work that's trying to engage with the politics of the time. And this was coming off the Reagan years. Um, and, you know, that was just a horrible time. Either you got along with the greed and narrow mindedness and warmongering that was Ronald Reagan and his program, or you rebelled against it in some way. And they, there wasn't a lot of, lot of choice. And, but that 
presidency in that time came after the upheaval that was the 60s, both the, the civil rights movement, but the anti-war movement, the, the women's liberation movement. And there was, you know, particularly because of the, the, the movement against the Vietnam War, people were burning the American flag in the, in the streets at protests and things like that. And for, you know, a good decade after, you know, 1968, people were still really deeply critical of America as a whole. And, and so, you know, when George Herbert Walker Bush ran, you know, vice president then aiming to become President Bush ran for office, he was appearing in flag factories um, and, and basically saying America doesn't have a king or a queen to unite us. What we have is the American flag. And that was both really weird in a certain sense, because there wasn't this whole fervent public display of patriotism that had been kind of pushed back by large sections of society, not just, you know, the kids in the street, but lots of people were very, didn't feel the, 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 the enthusiasm for America that is being promoted, say, today. Um, and so it was out of touch, but it was also kind of dangerous and in, in sort of saying, well, there should only be one view of the flag. And so I was making a lot of work that were more installations for audience participation that use the flag as an image to talk about to to you know talk about some of the po politics but relate it to America, and then I said, well, actually, because Bush is making this a question, I need to respond with art, and and so the the work then did ha was constructed the way it was, but it really wanted to give people, particularly those who've been victimized by America, and feel sort of the brunt of the brutality that happens to them. I mean, right now we're seeing protests around George Floyd, um, you know, there, there were a lot of people that felt that way even before George Floyd. And a lot of the people I knew, I mean, I knew people who had family members killed by police um, and that they said, look, the cops wear the flag on their arms as they murder our, our children and or our sisters and brothers. And so this work actually was really trying to address sort of you know, give give people the opportunity to debate and discuss what, what U.S. the United States is, what U.S. patriotism is, and what the U.S. flag is. So I think this is an, it raises a lot of interesting questions because I think you're saying in a way that there's um, there's a way in which you wanted to question patriotism or fidelity to the U.S. by showing the flag in these different ways, uh, but I think there's some people who would argue that it's actually quite patriotic to. Uh, use the flag in these ways to burn the flag or to to question these precepts of America is actually it's not actually anti patriotic maybe it's patriotic I'm I'm curious for you uh, with all the symbolism um, and and really the sense of loyalty and emotion that a lot of Americans attach to the American flag um, did you feel that you wanted to say something about um, the flag itself, were you, were you trying to criticize America itself and the idea of America, or were you trying to change how people use the flag? Were you trying to reclaim the flag for some different part of America? Well, I wasn't trying to reclaim the flag. I mean, I, I actually, you know, a lot of people, a lot of my friends have a love-hate relationship with America. They actually say, well, look, you know, I, I really like the ideals of America, but I don't like a lot of what it's become. And I kind of have a hate-hate relationship with America. This is a country that was founded on slavery and genocide. The, the U.S. Constitution was written by enslavers and friends of enslavers to define the legal and political framework for a society whose economic foundation and roots were in slavery. It today is based on exploitation and oppression. It has raged wars. It, it's just, it is a monstrous place that causes tremendous destruction and pain and suffering. And, you know, that is my personal view. And I don't think there's anything to reclaim there. I think people who have aspired to justice and a, a better world don't need to reach back to a, a country whose foundations is in owning human beings. There, there's nothing liberatory or exciting about that. The you, idea you're, of... Yeah. You're an American citizen, right? Are, are I was you? born here. Yeah, yeah, I was born here. Yeah. My, you know, Black American parents were born here. Their parents were born here. Right. Um, eventually people were in parts of West Africa and dragged here involuntarily. But yeah, I, you know... I'm, my passport says America. Yeah, I'm just interested in it from from that point of view. I think it's just to, for transparency for the audience to understand yeah. that you're you're yeah. asking these questions not as someone looking from the outside, but from from within. Um, yeah. Can you tell us? Okay, can you tell us what happened? Uh, why did this end up being a Supreme uh, Court case? I don't know if we want to exit out of this view or. Yeah, let's let's exit. I mean, people can then see my charming face. Let's yeah. <laughs> let's see if we can uh, do that. 
I'm yeah. sure they'd love to see your face. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, um, the the piece, the 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 route to the Supreme Court was a bit circuitous. Um, you know, you noted that George Bush, you know, called my work disgraceful, which I thought was a tremendous honor. I mean, I was 24 years old and I was like, wait, the president of the United States knows my work exists and he doesn't like what I'm doing. This is fantastic. I want to do this for the rest of my life. But also because of some complex history and I, it's not really worth going into. I'm happy to talk about it, but it is a bit of a, a there's a lot of detail, but the short answer is that the United States, including people like George Bush, were trying to make patriotism mandatory. There was, they were trying to make it so that there was only one perceptible and allowable view of the flag. And there were a lot of people that were opposed to that. And there was a case that had arose out of a flag burning that happened that a man named Joey Johnson burned a flag at the Republican National Convention in 1984. And that went to the Supreme Court in 1989. The Congress didn't like the Supreme Court ruling, which said that it basically that was free speech, that the, there was a right to political dissent in this country. And so they passed a law that sort of tried to overturn the Supreme Court case. That was a, a Texas law, so they wrote a federal statute. And in part of that statute, it actually referenced my artwork and saying, look, we, we want to outlaw displaying the flag of the United States on the floor or ground. And Bob Dole and other senators explicitly called out my artwork and saying, this is why we need this law. And so I and others, including Joey Johnson, the defendant from the 1984 case, burned flags on the steps of the Capitol a couple days after the law went into effect. Actually, literally the second the law went into effect, people all around the country burned flags but they didn't arrest anybody because they were trying to say, well, everybody in America hates these flag burners, so we have to pass this law. And then all of a sudden, all sorts of Americans are burning flags, so they said, let's ignore it. So we went to a place where they couldn't ignore it. And then that became, burning flags on the steps of the Capitol became a Supreme Court case. It went straight to the Supreme Court. And, and because of that case, people can do whatever they want with the flag. They can fly it on a pole, they can make art with it as artists like Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg, uh, Andy Warhol have done. Um, you can blow your nose in the flag, you could put it on the floor as part of an artwork as I have done. And some would argue that that's actually the most American thing one could do. I mean, I understand that you, you don't believe, <laughs> really believe in this <laughs> idea of America, but that to be able to do whatever you want to the flag is in essence, you know, a First Amendment protection like that, a democracy that protects people's rights to do that is actually part of what would make America, you know, if America can actually achieve that ideal of letting artists do whatever it wants to its flag, um, or for that matter, all kinds of free expression, that that's actually the kind of society that they aspire to have or aspire to live in. Um, I was criminally prosecuted for, for doing that. And I think that, you know, you, you say that that's the essence of patriotism. I don't think that, say, Donald Trump would agree with that assessment. And I think that, you know, he has recently gone on record saying people, I mean, soon after he was president, he said people should lose their citizenship if they burn the flag and become stateless people, which is very dangerous. Now he's just saying, well, we should re-examine the Supreme Court case and overturn it and pass new laws and criminalize that form of dissent. And so, you know, it, I would think there are more people that say that Donald Trump and people in elected office are more genuinely American than I am. And, and, and I say, fine, that's true. I think that, that he is. I think he's a fitting representative of America, um, even though I think he's a monstrous fascist that should be driven from power. Um, so these but, are, this is fascinating to me because I grew up you know, in public school in Ohio pledging mm -hmm. allegiance to the flag. Yeah. And you can say I would, was indoctrinated, but I feel, some, I feel something when I'm on the 4th of July and I see a flag. Uh, I also feel it should be people's, you know, right to burn the flag, do whatever they want to the flag. But I felt, I, I remember feeling very distinctly after 9-11, um, when there were people who were using the flag in a very specific way to uh, argue for the invasion of Iraq, even though we realized there were no <laughs> weapons of mass destruction there, it was not actually connected to the attacks yeah. on the World Trade yeah. Center. That, um, that the flag had actually been taken from people like me who might be less oriented towards, you know, starting wars that are, are not substantiated or unjust wars, that now this symbol belonged more to someone else. And, and I, so it's just very fascinating to me that as an artist, um, you've chosen to say the symbol itself, right? The symbol actually represents too many bad things or or that the symbol doesn't you know 
maybe it doesn't shouldn't matter to people like me. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I'm just throwing I, I mean, that out to provoke your as an opinion. artist, I use symbols. I mean, I have my own personal views of what the flag is, but as an artist, I use symbols. And the United States flag is a very powerful symbol that people feel very attached to. It's actually why the work, what is the proper way to display a US flag? can work. It's because people see that symbol when they have a lot of connections to a country which they, which people feel very strongly about. And so, you know, the Colin Kaepernick's of the world view, view the flag differently than say, you know, the, the George Bush's of the world or the, the, in Donald Trump's of the world. And I think that, that using that symbol and opening up the question, the, the work doesn't, doesn't necessarily express exclusively my viewpoint. My viewpoint is included within the work and it allows people who are typically thought of as or are often victimized by American society, who've been brutalized by the police, who've you know been hunted as, as immigrants here. It allows them to have equal footing to talk about their views, including to say, hey, I love America, which some people have done. I mean, the, the writing in the book ranges from you should be shot um, and your family should be made to pay for, pay for it, or I wouldn't defend you, or you, you know, and Navy SEALs threatening my life and cops threatening my life, to people being contemplative and looking back and saying, look, I'm a German girl, and if 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 we Germans had carried on our, at our flag the way you all do, we would be called Nazis again, to people who felt, you know, we're talking about what it means to grow up in a country that literally wants them dead and doesn't care whether they live. And so the, as an artist, my job is to actually open up questions in around, I think, important social questions to actually shed light on new ways for people to think about and discuss important topical questions. Even, and it's motivated from where, how I understand what the US is and what the flag is. And I would argue as you know, a friend with you, but also with other people like, look, I don't think that immigrants who, or others who were trained, you know, indoctrinated in, in school. And I went to the same kinds of schools, although I went to a private school, but you know, it's like, you know, we, we at, for parts of time, we're saying the Pledge of Allegiance and, and you know, you get trained from your earliest years that, you know, you might be able to be critical of certain things of America, but oh, wow, the 4th of July is a good thing. And, and but then when you actually look, well, you know, this, this country, I mean, it, you know, bombed a civilian population and claimed that was just because it ended a war. It literally, you know, had a Supreme Court ruling that said the, the founders didn't think of black people, you know, enslaved people as human beings that were that literally thought of them as inferior. Even somebody like President Lincoln, you know, openly says, I want my race, the white race, to be in a superior position to black people. And that's the guy who like eliminated slavery, supposedly. And so I don't think there's much good here. And if you look at the present day, my God, this is a country that can't even allow healthcare workers to have protective equipment in the midst of a pandemic. And it's a wealthy country. Why are we so fascinated by hanging on to the, the, the concept that we have of America that we learned in a fourth break civics class, as opposed to looking squarely and soberly at what the whole history of this country has been and what it is at present. Because you raised a number of issues there, I have to ask you about your name. So you carry yeah. this name Dred Scott with a slightly mm -hmm. different spelling, but as a very famous uh, black yeah. man in U.S. history, led to the um, was the plaintiff in the famous Supreme Court ruling, yeah. um, the case that basically uh, asserted in 1857, I believe that uh, black, black people in this country didn't have the full rights of the constitution conferred on citizens. And so did you, were you given this name? Uh, did you <laughs> give yourself the name? Uh, what's your connection with the Dred Scott of the 19th century? Okay, so, you know, Dred Scott was an enslaved man who in 1857 had a case go to the Supreme Court, but the ruling, you know, is what you said. And as part of the ruling, it said there are no rights that a black person has that a white man is bound to respect. Um, that was written by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, Roger Taney. Um, and, you know, it was, you know, my parents were good people. They would never name anybody Dred Scott. That would be a horrible burden to place on a kid. Um, it was a name I chose by myself. I mean, I kind of, you know, at the name, at the time I was becoming a, a sort of a real artist, a legitimate artist or whatever, thinking about art as a profession. Um, you know, the, the, I was a, a punk rock kid. I was in, into, you know, and you might not know that from my hair today, but, but you know, back in the, the 80s, I was in, into punk music and I had friends that were in bands and, you know, 
dude named Virus X. I would meet people named Joey Shithead, see people on Saturday Night Live called Lee Ving. Um, you know, and, and so I was like, wait, even though I'm not, you know, playing in a band with that name, I actually want a name that, that is sort of my stage name. And specifically, I wanted one that enabled people to confront and think about some pivotal moments in American history whenever they heard it. And so I took the name Dred Scott, and as you noted, I've spelled it differently than the historic figure. The historic figure was D-R-E-D, and I'm D-R-E-A-D, because I also wanted to bring in the concept of dread, both in terms of fear, but also as somewhat as, as Rastafarians use it. I'm, I'm an atheist, I'm not a Rasta, but I do think the concept that they have of dread is kind of interesting and, and, and tough. So. Okay, we might need to come back to that. I'll just put a pin in that because I want to talk about more of your work specifically. Yeah. So okay. to come to much more recent work of yours, we just talked about a piece you did way back as an art student. Uh, yeah. But more recently in the fall, you reenacted the largest rebellion of enslaved people in American history, yes. just outside of New Orleans. And I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to see this firsthand because it sounded fascinating, um, you know, reading about it in Vanity Fair and other places in the media. Um, so can you show us some images from that and yeah. talk about why you did that project? Um, well, I definitely show some images and, you know, it's again, as you know, my work, let's get back to sharing the screen so I could, well, you know, uh, um, I want to try and get the Play. So, you know, my work works in a lot of different ways. And, you know, the work was a project that was in, in development for about six years, but it was a community engaged project that, you know, you said, I, I reenacted this. That's true, but it was me and 350 people. It was a reenactment of the largest rebellion of enslaved people. That rebellion originally happened in 1811. And the people who were the rebels, the enslaved people, were trying to seize all of Orleans territory and set up an African Republic in the New World that would have eliminated slavery. They wanted to basically see all of modern day Louisiana and make a, a free republic similar to what was done in Haiti. And so I thought that was a profound vision of freedom and liberation and, and that something that needed to be brought into the present. A lot of my work um, looks at how the past both sets the stage for the present, but also how it exists in the present in new form. And so I wanted to look at both the history of enslavement, but more importantly, the history of liberation, how these enslaved people were self-determined and agents of change and had the most radical vision of freedom in, in the continental US at the time. Um, you know, it was more radical than the founding fathers whose idea of freedom required owning people and it was more radical than the French colonial society, which largely was defining New Orleans at the time, which though they had the declaration of the rights of man, they were a slave empire, which in Guadeloupe, Martinique, Saint-Domingue, it, that's where their wealth came from. So we did this reenactment, but it was community engaged. It wasn't just a bunch of actors doing this. We actually worked for several years having, uh, you know, sort of gatherings over food and talking with people and designing costumes. I had a costume department, but we wanted to actually give enslaved people back their humanity. So we wanted costumes that were really accurate and not just like burlap sack, burlap sack, burlap sack. We looked at runaway slave ads to actually see what people who believe they own somebody would describe them as having worn. And it's like, wait a minute, it wasn't burlap sack. It was very varied. And so we wanted to be period specific, but also um, change how people saw the enslaved. We had sewing circles where people made these costumes. This is uh, Sly Watts. He's learning to sew by making a costume for, for his participation in slave rebellion reenactment, but also other people who were professional seamstresses teaching people to sew so they can make the costumes. And this was done largely in and around New Orleans, but as far away as Chicago. Um, we had to design flags. We know that in 1811, um, the rebels actually carried flags because the general at the time, General Wade Hampton, wrote to the governor saying there are 500 brigands in the field and they're marching in formation under flags. So this was a disciplined army. They didn't say what the flags were, so we designed them. This is using a symbol from modern day Ghana that means hope and confidence. Um, often flags in slave revolts would say liberty or death. This is not a misspelled or typo of French, it's Louisiana Creole. And this is a symbol that we thought, well, Africans might have used with, uh, this is people that were Yoruba or, or people from uh, Congo would actually be inspired by, uh, this is Gu or Agun's sword. So we made flags, we trained people to walk as a disciplined army. Um, and these are some images from the reenactment itself. I mean, they, there was an uprising where enslavers were attacked or people portraying enslavers. Sometimes they managed to be left for dead on the levee. 
Um, it, you know, as I said, this involved 350 people. There were people on horses. Everybody had muskets or machetes or sickles or sabers. Um, there was a battle scene that happened in a field. And, but this past and the present, this thing of, you know, imagine driving to work in, and this is outside the town of Norco, past the New Orleans oil company, oil refinery, um, and seeing 350 armed black people with antiquated weapon in 19th century French colonial clothing, but ma marching past a contemporary oil, oil refinery, be like, what am I seeing? And in that space, um, you know, people can rethink a lot of long held assumptions. And I, I think that this is, this image really concentrates a lot about my thinking on the project of, you know, it's, this was a beautiful <laughs> sight of, you know, this, this liberating army colliding with the present. And so, you know, you see modern day cars, modern day oil refineries, but these beautiful, powerful people you know, marching through the streets of New Orleans and through exurban New Orleans on a two day march covering 26 miles, chanting onto New Orleans, freedom or death, we're gonna end slavery, join us. This is so fascinating to me because of course I live in Boston and I'm not far from Lexington and Concord where those shots heard around the world um, in the Revolutionary War uh, period happened. And there are reenactors who are highly devoted to reenacting some of those revolutionary war battles, just as there yeah. are at Gettysburg and, you know, through the South uh, for Civil War reenactments. Uh, but I've never seen, I've never seen uh, a slave <laughs> revolt reenactment. Uh, yeah. Were you inspired at all by the reenactors who do sort of historical reenactments? Uh, did you draw on any of their techniques or do you see this as really yeah. apart from that? So this is the first slave rebellion reenactment that I know of. And so, you know, I, a lot of how I think about art is I often think of, well, what doesn't exist? Why doesn't it exist? And should it exist? And that's how I thought of it. And one day I, th I thought, you know, I've never seen a slave rebellion reenactment. And until that day, I didn't know much about reenactment. But when I thought of the idea, I went to, I went to see the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, which was awesome and horrible at the same time. It was awesome. There were 10,000 serious history buffs that were there to do the reenactment plus a bunch of spectators. And so I wanted to learn from how you organize something of that scale or that size, how, how you engage with history. But it also struck me that a lot of that, particularly Civil War and to a lesser degree Revolutionary War reenactment, but Civil War reenactment is, it's a white supremacist sort of venture that is retelling history from the, the perspective at a minimum of oh, this was a, the Civil War was a tragedy. And it's like, oh, no, it wasn't. It was the one good war the United States has fought. And it wasn't fought for moral reasons. I mean, it, it was often like, you know, we hear, oh, the Civil War was terrible. Brother fought brother. Well, actually, no. People defending enslavement fought people who were trying to end enslavement. And, you know, that's what it was about. And so that was a good thing that people, including a lot of formerly enslaved people, self-liberated formerly enslaved people, fought to end slavery. And so, you know, the Civil War reenactment, they, amongst other things, they have, I mean, they're very, very, very few black people that participate. Um, it's a Southern tradition. And on both sides, there would have been black people in like in Gettysburg, for example, the South would have had people that, I mean, if you wanted to move a cannon in those days, it was pulled by mules and the people who handled mules were teamsters. And many of those people were free black people that it was a really good job to have. Uh, they weren't allowed to fight in the Union Army in, in 1863, but they were part of the, the war effort. And then in, in, on the Southern side, I mean, the, you know, white people weren't going to go into war without the people they enslaved, like carrying their boots for them and cleaning their stuff. And so, you know, but you look at this reenactment and you see this thing of, oh, it's a, you know, brother, it's a tragedy and it's like about really cool costumes and there are no black people. And it's like, well, wait a minute, this is wrong. And so this question of doing a reenactment, but as an art project that could foreground the con the social question. I mean, we put a lot of effort on getting costumes right and troop movements right and stuff with that. But really, this was emphasizing the social question of this was a project about freedom and emancipation. It wasn't about slavery. It was having people embody freedom and emancipation and have that connection between the past and the present. So we had modern day shoes. If you notice, I had my glasses on that were, you know, we weren't trying to pretend this is exactly how it was. Whereas, you know, with Civil War reenactment, they really try and say, this is exactly how it was in 1863 or 1862 or 1865. And we were like, no, we're using the language of reenactment to talk about both America's past, but also our present right now and how people get free. 
I think it's also fascinating that you invented the flags, not knowing what yeah. the historical flags were. So yes, yeah. I know I know a Civil War reenactor actually who talks about you know the button. They spend a lot of time finding like the exact button. So the button yeah. is not um, you know historical anachronism. Uh, but even in in just thinking about the flag, we talked about you know your uh, other work that has involved flags. Uh, we know that they're used in war. We know that flags are used in political protest. Uh, what was on your mind as you were trying to concoct the flags that should serve in the reenactment of the rebellion? Yeah. Well, we were trying to use them for a couple of things. One, to actually imply and show that these were not just angry black people who one day got up off the plantation and decided to strike out in a disorderly way. I mean, the, the original 1811 revolt was planned for over a year. Um, and there were people who probably had military training, some of them who probably came from the Ashanti kingdom, um, some of whom may have been in the re revolution in Haiti, which was actually extremely disciplined, where, where the Haitian forces, you know, by 1803 had defeated the strongest navy in the world, France, um, you know, and so it's, we wanted to show that there was an aspect of organization and discipline, but we also wanted to look at what would African people and people of African descent have used to unite themselves across difference. I mean, there were some of these, you know, I said that these people might've had experience in the Asante kingdom. There was a civil war going on. People were fighting each other. And, they, and you know, some of the, say the, you know, the, um, like the Dahomey were like actually kind of brutal rulers that oppressed a lot of the people around them. And so these people, some of them were literally at war with each other, but when they got to America and were enslaved, they saw a common, a common, in, a common enemy and a common purpose. And so we wanted to make flags that actually drew on what would have potentially existed in 1811 that might have said, oh, well, there are a lot of Yorubas, so maybe we can unite the Yoruba and the Congolese around a shared God that they had. Or liberty or death is something that is something that people kind of know, but often here we think of it as Patrick Henry. But actually in the research into slave revolts, we saw that there were lots of different times where flags saying liberty or death or death or liberty were raised. And so we wanted to draw it to the history, but also have something that was beautiful, but also emphasizing that this was planned, it was disciplined, it was people with a vision for freedom, it was not just spontaneous, it was not just people with you know, anger, but it was people with a vision. Do you hope when you make works of art like this uh, to produce a specific political or social change? I mean, it strikes me that in the case of your student artwork, what is the proper way to display a US flag? It led to a political outcome, which was a Supreme Court decision reaffirming people's right to the face, hang the flag however they want. Mm -hmm. uh, do you hope for some specific outcome with the slave rebellion reenactment or is it more about a process or a provocation for the people who witness it? Um, it's, I mean, a lot of my work is about ideas and about ideas that I think are important social questions. In a weird way, slave rebellion reenactment became a harbinger of what we're seeing right now. I mean, in, in ways that could not have been predicted. I mean, who, who knew that yet another police killing was going to lead to white people in small towns in middle America that don't have any black people saying Black Lives Matter? That is incredible, but it was not predictable. It wouldn't be predictable that, that there's all the upheaval that exists around George Floyd and Black Lives Matter would exist, nor would it be predictable that, one of the, the, that there would be a disease that is a, res a respiratory virus that had the highest rate of death in, on a county level in the place where our reenactment took place because of the, you saw the oil refinery in the background. Well, that's an area known as Cancer Alley because of the high rates of, of, of cancer, 50 times what it is in, in other parts of the country, but also high respiratory distress and disease from petrochemical companies. And so when COVID stalked people and particularly black people, that region of the, the country was the one where there was tremendous death of largely of black people. And so this, this artwork became kind of a harbinger, but it, it's not like I predicted this, but it's more, it was talking about questions of race, talking about racism, talking about freedom, talking about emancipation. And those are big questions and about the, how, how, this, how our past connects to our present. Those are the kinds of things that I'm working at. So I'm not really, I mean, like with what is the proper way to display a US flag? It ended up in the Supreme Court, but that, you know, in, the culture wars hadn't happened when I made the work. So even if I was like a shrewd calculating artist, I was like, oh, I'm gonna get something that's really gonna piss off the president 
there would be no basis to know that when I made the work. Um, and I don't really think about the political process like that. I do think about how can my work and the idea, how, you, know, f you know, I did a work called um, A Man Was Lynched by Police Yesterday, which actually talked about the history of police brutality and connecting it to lynching in this country. It was modeled on a NAACP flag that they flew during their anti-lynching campaign in the 20s and 30s. And, you know, it, that work became sort of particularly around the, the, the resistance around the death and murder, the lynching of George Floyd became something that got tweeted and retweeted, grammed and regrammed and was reprinted in Vogue and, and, and the Smithsonian and National Geographic and many art publications. And that was really great. But when I, again, when I made the work, I didn't know that there was, I didn't know that George Floyd was going to exist. I made the work in 2015 into the response of a police murder of, of, of Walter Scott. And, um, you know, I, 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 what I do know is that the police in this country are basically inheritors of lynch mob terror. They've shown that again and again and again and again. And that's a huge question in society. Making work that talks about that and enabling people to understand that question in different ways and new ways is what I do. Whether there ends up being legislation that outlaws the police from murdering people, unarmed people, black people just because they're black, That'd be great, but I don't, that's not the aim I have with the work. The aim I have with the work is for people, particularly those that are, you know, broadly speaking, sympathetic to my viewpoint. I want them to get outside of their comfort zone and come closer to a more radical view of, of the world and have a more deep understanding of, in a certain sense, just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Um, and so, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not, mostly in an instrumental way trying to shape political outcome. I am trying to sort of shape, pose questions and shape discourse um, that moves society hopefully in a direction that is better than the one we have. So I want to invite Abdullah Fayad to join us, who is my colleague and editorial board member at The Globe, and he's going to uh, present some audience questions that we've been getting Great. in advance and, and through this conversation. Hi, Abdullah. Unmute, unmute. <laughs> I unmuted myself now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Thanks, Bina, and thanks, Dred, for doing this. Um, we got a lot of reader questions uh, who a lot of people are very interested in your work. Um, you know, this is this is kind of similar to what you're talking about now. Um, one reader was wondering, you know, what in particular makes performance art such an effective political tool? Um, well, I don't, I mean, I don't think that performance art is necessarily a great political tool. I think art can actually, if, if the artist does, their, if we do our job right, we will be able to shine a light using aesthetics on important social questions in ways that, you know, challenge, challenge some assumptions and enable people to think about it in new and deeper ways. With performance art, which I've been focusing on a fair amount recently over the past like eight years I've been doing a lot more performance based work than not just or mostly work in galleries even though that's where most of my work shows is in galleries and museums um, but the performance work it, it, unlike say a theatrical piece which is performative where somebody is where actors are performing a script the outcome is known even if the audience doesn't know it there's sort of a, an understanding of like oh I'm going to sit and watch a story of some sort. And I know that I might have my ideas changed at the end, but I kind of know that nothing is going to go beyond beyond the theater stage and that's the agreement. And, and some theater can be really great like that. Um, with performance art, there's a lot more unknown, but the audience doesn't know where the performance quite often quite literally is going, but the performer isn't performing something they've performed before. And so that uncertainty and danger, and I don't mean danger in a, a threat to individuals typically sort of way, but the, the, where there is, where you don't know kind of the parameters and you can actually often, I think, feel a connection with the artist. I mean, I did a performance where I walked into the high pressure water jet from a fire hose, remembering the, the, the civil rights demonstrators from 1963 in Birmingham. And, you know, for people watching that, there was an audience of about 500 people, you know, there was a real question, would I be okay? which in a theater, you wouldn't have that question. And so that, that visceral reaction, that connection, and I didn't know what it was going to be like to be hit with this fire hose. I, I knew why I wanted to do it, 
but I didn't know how much pain it would be. I didn't know whether, I mean, one thing I didn't expect is that it would be really cold. It happened that it, we did it on a relatively cold October day. It was warm, warm for October, but cold for having water on you. And I didn't expect that. And so that visceral, how my body was reacting, then is expressed in the performance and then the audience can see that. And so when you deal with social questions, it's like, wait, this does connect to 1963 and the vulnerability and pain that those civil rights demonstrators took up to end Jim Crow violence, including lynching. You know, it wasn't just about we want the right to vote, but it was like, oh my God, the reason we have to, to do this is because they will literally kill us if we don't. And um, so I think performance art can have that, that real connection to, to an audience in a way that I'm interested in. But I also think that, you know, something like, you know, man was lynched by police yesterday, or what is the proper way to display a US flag, which those are not performance pieces, but they became part of important social debates because in those two cases, the work concentrated those questions in ways that was accessible towards an audience and people, and it was on a question that people felt strongly about. So people who didn't like the work mostly weren't changed to my viewpoint, but they were like, no, you can't do that. And people who did kind of sort of agree were like, man, that's kind of extreme to have the US flag on the ground, but well, actually, what is so great about the US? Why do I think it's good? I wanna maybe have to go defend that and have others be in debate with me and others could say, well, yeah, this is the flag that, that was used to, that flew over the massacre of my people as they stole our land. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't think it's performance art per se, but I do think art that touches on social questions can get into political discourse in ways that, that perhaps is shut down in other areas of society. Yeah, well, you talk about how, you know, you're kind of, when you're reenacting something, um, you're bringing the emotions kind of to the fore. Um, mm -hmm you know, and, and reliving that in the present day can connect you to a past time and, yeah. and you know, reacquaint the audience uh, with something that they thought was, you know, long ago. Um, and so, you know, one, one writer who, uh, one reader who was um, particularly, quote unquote, wowed by your s slave rebellion reenactment um, was wondering how you deal with concerns um, of trauma for people who do the reenactments. You were talking yeah. also about how they weren't necessarily actors. This was community driven, um, yeah. but it is really personal and, 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 and a family history for a lot of these people. So how, how do you deal with that concern? Yeah, um, well, one is that there was a lot of conversation both in the run up to the piece, but also during the performance where people were talking about those questions. I mean, this particular, I mean, with most performance art, but this project in particular, it was as much for the performers as for the audience. And it was a ritual. I mean, it was, you know, two days you were, you know, you were cold, you were wet, you were walking through country, uh, area of the country, which while a lot of people we knew were really appreciative of us and really liked it and was from the communities a lot of these people came from, there were other people we know in those communities who it was clan country. And so it was, so that past and present commingling, it was very, a very intense experience for people. But one of the things that I was really sort of strengthened by in my determination to do it is that, again, this is not about sort of embracing or enacting the trauma that was in, vis visited upon people during times of enslavement. These were freedom fighters. This was a liberating army. This was an army of the enslaved. And that fighting back, that vision of like, we are the ones with agency and we're gonna change the world and we're gonna end slavery both in the past and the present, really was something that people kind of got in their bones. By the time we got to the last day, there was a time when we had to kind of wait, I mean, just an accident basically. The horse, we, we took buses from one area to another. I mean, we rented buses and the horses got stuck in traffic. So we had to wait for part of our army to catch up once we got to the city of New Orleans. And these fierce young women, including a lot of queer women, were just so beautiful and chanting, Ashe, Ashe, Liberté, Liberté, um, when we were at the old US Mint, which we started there in, in, once we were in the city of New Orleans because there was an advanced detachment of enslaved people in 1811 who was trying to seize that Mint that that fort, it was a fort in 1811, so that people when they got out of the plantations would have weapons to seize the city. And so they really felt this spirit of liberation and, and were just, and Ashe is a, a, word, a Yoruba word that means the power to make things happen. And so it was like, we have the power to make things happen 
and it, it's somewhat religious and divine, but it is still very intense experience. Um, and and so, you know, that confidence of like, look, we are freedom fighters. It's not about trauma; it's about liberation. And and that and viewing viewing our ancestors as agents of their own change, as self determined, as opposed to victims of slavery and just broken by slavery and the trauma of that that was actually really important for the people being whole and okay after it. And then we did have a, a plan to, to do various self-care and things afterwards, which largely wasn't necessary because people felt so strong off of it. Well, so one last question that I have for you because we're running out of time um, is a little bit more logistical. Um, you know, given how art programs are always the first to get budgetary cuts when <laughs> Um, you know, there is any form of financial crisis. Um, you know, how do you make your art accessible so it's not, you know, just people who can afford it, who can see it, um, you know, how, yeah, just how do you make sure that it has a wider audience and it can reach people who otherwise don't have access? Well, I mean, access is important both in terms of education, but also in terms of public access. With a lot of my work, it is in public. I mean, Slave Rebellion reenactment, if you were in that area, if you live there or if you could get there, you could see it for free. A project that I did with Castles and, and Rafa Espaza, which is a brilliant project. It was a skywriting project about immigrants in detention and making detention centers visible um, to society and, and, and making the, the horror of migrant detention. It was a skywriting project. So they arranged uh, to work with all these artists and activist groups to have sky typing above these immigrant detention centers and, and, and other places. And so above the Statue of Liberty on July 4th weekend, I wrote the name of the first man who was was uh, killed by COVID in, in immigrant detention. Uh, uh, um, and, you know, those things are public. You look up in the sky and you see them. Or with, with um, you know, a man was lynched by police yesterday. If you're walking past the gallery where it is, you just see it. And I think that's part of why I do that is because I want it to be in public. But also museums, even though some of them are can be expensive, typically one of the things I like about museums and galleries is they are often free or there are times when they're free. The question is, do people want to go in them? And I know when I was a kid, I didn't, I mean, I lived relatively near the, the Art Institute of Chicago where I ultimately went to school with the school attached to it. Once a year I got dragged to it and I hated it. It was boring. I wasn't the kid who liked to paint or draw. And we saw a bunch of, I mean, I like going to see the armor. The armor was kind of cool, like at the Met, but you know, the, 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 most of the paintings were stuff I didn't understand and was told I couldn't understand in a certain sense. And the guards made you feel like you were gonna steal something. And so a lot of the work didn't seem to be both, it wasn't, wasn't literally of interest to me, but it also conceptually wasn't something that was of interest to people like me by and large. And the kind of work I make, I think is of interest to people like me by and large. If I saw my work as a kid, I probably wouldn't be like, oh wow, this is what I wanna do with my life. But I'd be like, this is interesting. This is different than, than what I expected. And so that's, I think, really important. And this question about budget cuts and school departments, the, I mean, I think, you know, the world really needs art like this. And it's not gonna get, continue to get made if you cut off the generation of people who are thinking, well, what am I gonna do with my life and shape them into more things like, well, really what we need is more MBAs so we can you know, have, you know, we, we need cashiers and we need people who can manage cashiers. That's, that's a very narrow world. Or, you know, it's like, there's a lot of focus on the stock market right now. My God, I mean, if, if there's anything that shows the bankruptcy of just focusing on the bottom line in the stock market, COVID does this. There's, you know, 170,000 dead people who were living in America, most of them Americans in this country, while, you know, the president of the United States is worried about keeping the stock, the Dow Jones high. I mean, this is insane. If we have more people that are thinking like that, they're going to be more death, more suffering. And it's like, it's just, it's coincidental. It didn't have to be that way. It could be that somebody who was interested in the stock market also was interested in human lives and figuring out how can we, you know, have a healthcare system that serves people's needs in the midst of a pandemic? How can we actually make a vaccine accessible to everybody for free so that we can actually get people to take the vaccine and then have it so that the, the virus goes away? But that's not what currently or spontaneously is going to happen if you really focus narrowly on profit, 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 and more profit. 
which is what you were taught from day one in America. And, and so artists are people who kind of slip through the cracks and fall through the holes. And, and we need people like that to question, well, why is it that say a vaccine should, why if, the, if, if much of the funding for a vaccine for COVID is coming from government funding, taxpayer funding, we've already bought the vaccine. How dare you sell it back to us? You know, this is something the intellectual property should be in the public interest, including around the world, or this competition of like, oh my God, the Russians or the Chinese are going to develop a cure. Well, wouldn't that be a good thing if they actually have a safe thing as opposed to, well, we're going to, you know, have the Russians tested on their whole population and see who lives and dies. You know, that's a little dangerous. There, there does need to be a phase three trial, but it would be a really great thing if the Russians or the, the, the Indians or, or the, the Chinese or the Americans developed it if it was accessible to everybody so that we aren't plagued by a virus. That would be a really good thing. And so artists question basic assumptions like that or the good ones do. And so we need to fund schools so that you get people who challenge the status quo from day one. Well, thanks so much, Dred. Uh, Bina, I'm gonna pass it back to you. Sure, and we're, we're past our time, but if you have a few more moments, I just wanna ask you uh, like a closing question. Um, sure. This, I mean, I just feel like there's so much more we could talk about. We haven't, when you were talking about the stock market, I realized we haven't even talked about your performance art piece from 2010 and where you strapped uh, dollar bills and $20 bills to yourself and burned them on Wall Street. Yeah. But I commend to everyone to check out Dred's website where you can see a whole range of his projects and, and artworks um, over the years. But I kind of just want to put to you this question that I think gets debated among artists a fair amount, which is around, you know, is all art political is sort of the, the sort of more um, esoteric version of the question. Um, because your art is maybe on the spectrum of art, if you compare it to landscape paintings that mimic Monet, it is more overtly political. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but it's not so overtly political, you're saying that you want a specific political outcome from it. It's not advocacy for a specific yeah. outcome in society. Um, what do you make of the, the argument, you know, um, that art uh, should be serving explicit political goals? Um, you know, I think there are people who would say, let's fund the art so that we can get X outcome, or let's fund this kind of art for um, this change in society when they see artists like you who are able to produce social and political change. So what do you think the role is of the artists in political change? Should artists be forced to participate in political change? Uh, is all art political or not? Ah, well, that's, so we only want to go like an extra two or three hours? Okay, cool. <laughs> right. um, yeah. yeah. Just uh, so, like question. Yeah. No, I, so, I mean, I, I think when you force artists to do anything, the results typically aren't very good. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I don't think artists should be forced to make that. I do think artists should be inspired to, to you know, I think we, I mean, you know, I think we need a revolution. And, to, and I don't mean that like the way we need a revolution in marketing and just better, you know, a, a better de design for Heineken beer labels or something like that. I think we actually need to get rid of a system that is based on exploitation and oppression. I think we need to get to a world without exploitation, a communist world. That's a big question that most of your readers are like, oh my God, he has antenna coming out of his head. And we're not going to talk about that. But I do think that the, that the thing of, you know, my work is helping to create the, the context where people can rethink a lot of long held assumptions. And I think people should, if they're inspired to do that, they should do that. I have a lot of friends who are, you know, there's an arts organization called Four Freedoms, which is founded by Hank Willis Thomas and Eric Gottesman. And there are other artists that have participated. I've participated in it. They've done billboards. They've done, uh, you know, many different campaigns, you know, ads on TV sort of to, to have artists enter into the political process. Most of those artists have been for a couple of years really thinking, how can we make sure that Donald Trump doesn't win the election? That's what they want to do. And I have a lot of sympathy with that. I think, you know, as I said, Donald Trump is a, he's, he's running the country in a fascist foundation and trying to consolidate fascism. And I don't say that lightly. It's not just the worst political insult I can cast as somebody, but I do really think if you look at Germany and Italy and examples of fascist regimes, that's what this is. And so it really would matter if, if Trump were driven from power. I think it would be much better if there were 
thousands and hundreds of thousands of people in the streets demanding that he resign now and take Pence with him. And I don't think that even if the election happens, if, if it's at all close, he's already contested the election. So, you know, I think this really matters what the outcome is. But I, and there are a lot of artists that are using their art to try and, you know, change that. They, and, and that's, I think that's a good thing. But I also think that, that most art, most of the best art is not advocating for a particular policy at a particular time, even though I think that artists can do that and we're good at that. Um, you know, I think that, that, you know, artwork like Guernica, Picasso's Guernica, you know, one of the best known artists, one of his best known pieces is about the, the horror and the inhumanity of a fascist regime bombing a civilian population. It is resonant to this day because we can see in that painting what, what it means to have military oppression of civilians. And, and, and so work like that or work like Toni Morrison's Beloved, which is a ghost story about America and looking at enslavement and the history of slavery, we need work like that. And I think those kind of works are more lasting than even say some like uh, Daumier work, which might've actually been talking about a particular French election or something like that. I like Daumier's work, but you know, the best and most resonant and most lasting and most powerful at the time work is work that actually isn't necessarily talking about a particular candidate or a particular election or a particular outcome but is looking at some of the policies and concerns that those people concentrate that are big social questions. And so, you know, I, I think, yeah, I, th I think that, that, you know, I have a lot of respect for my artist friends who are doing work about particular, you know, basically trying to make good propaganda. I have a lot of respect for, for some of those artists, um, but I, I think the, the, the work that hits, hits home more and, and actually, you know, sometimes gets outlawed is the work that's really dangerous that talks about, wait, you wanna bring armed black people to a contemporary American city, or you wanna have the flag, which we think needs to unite all of us, something that people stand on? That, those are dangerous ideas. And we need dangerous ideas in, in times like this that are profoundly polarized and very dangerous. Dred, thank you so much for this conversation. Dred Scott, everyone, this was very provocative. I feel like it could go on for hours, but we don't have, have that much of your time. And thanks to everyone for joining us for this op talk.